Hello, welcome to Marine Biology at Home. In this lecture, we're going to be learning about larvae and larval ecology. Who am I? I'm Justin McAllister, and I'm an associate professor of biology and environmental studies, and I work at the College of the Holy Cross, which is located in Worcester, Massachusetts, about an hour's drive west of Boston. I teach courses in organismal biology, in marine biology, oceanography, ecology and biodiversity, and in invertebrate biology. And if you're interested in learning more about the research that I conduct with students or the courses that I teach, including summer courses, then I encourage you to check out my website or to check out my Twitter feed. I want to start this lecture by emphasizing this idea that animals are life cycles. Many people are familiar with the adult forms of marine organisms, such as these sea urchins that are depicted on the bottom of this slide but they may not fully appreciate the complexity of their life cycle and the different stages that, that an organism will develop through on its way to full maturity. In the case of these sea urchins, adults will uh, undergo a period of gonad maturation. So in this case, in response to rising seawater temperatures or increases in the amount of algae that's available for them to eat, they will uh, begin to produce eggs and sperm, and at some point during their life cycle, they will spawn these gametes out into the water column. And in the water column, the gametes will fuse and fertilize and will begin to develop into a larval stage. So the larval stage is, uh, in some cases, a feeding larval stage, and you can kind of think of the, these larvae as little feeding machines that have to gather as much food from the water column as possible. And the food for these organisms is going to be phytoplankton usually. Uh, the larvae will mature and may develop through a series of different larval stages. At some point then in response to some type of cue, it could be a chemical cue, it could just be a length of time of development type of cue, the organisms will metamorphose and settle as juveniles into the benthos, where they will begin feeding on a different food source. Ultimately, those juveniles will grow to a size such that they can then recruit into the adult habitat. How then do we define what is a larva, or what are larvae, or what is a larval stage, or what are the larval stages for a particular organism? One definition is a developmental definition that was put forth by Hickman in 1999. And this definition essentially states that the larva is functionally different from the adult. Another definition, an ecological one in this case, was put forth by Giza and Pierce in 1975. And this definition states that the larva is the post-embryonic stage of the life cycle that differs from the adult morphologically and is capable of independent locomotion. If we put these two definitions together, we essentially find that the larva or the larval stage is the stage of the life cycle that differs from the adult, both morphologically and functionally, and is capable of, a, of its own independent locomotion. In some cases, the larvae of many organisms were given their own species names hundreds of years ago because people didn't realize that the larvae of a particular organism was a unique uh, part of the life cycle. They actually thought that it was a different type of organism and so it got its own species name. Uh, most of these species names uh, of larvae have fallen by the wayside, but it's still sort of an, an interesting bit of history uh, to think about this idea that in one, at one time, larvae were thought to be independent organisms that were separate and unique from other organisms uh, for which we only knew the adult forms. And I think one can appreciate how truly unique and diverse and beautiful the larval stages of many marine organisms are when you see them all depicted on a slide such as this. Now this is by no means all of the larval forms that exist out in the ocean. This is just but a handful, but I do have depicted here the larval stages of diverse organisms such as snails, uh, lobsters, barnacles, annelid worms, uh, different echinoderms such as sea urchins and sea stars, and 
in all cases, it's important that we understand that larvae are very important stages in the life histories of many marine organisms because many marine organisms have this microscopic, long-lived, free-living larval stage that floats around in the water for days to weeks before settling and taking up an adult existence. They're very diverse in terms of their morphology and function, even within closely related organisms. So for example, I've highlighted two larval stages here. On the left is a feeding larval stage for a sea urchin, and on the right is a non-feeding larval stage for a different species of sea urchin. And in both cases, these larvae are fully formed. And the difference is that for the one on the left, the larva has to feed on phytoplankton food in order to grow and mature, whereas the one on the right does not have to feed. So even within taxa, you can find, even within closely related taxa, you can find very uh, different forms of larvae and the life cycles will reflect the, the differences that you see. If we can understand how larvae and by proxy also the, the eggs and the juveniles of marine organisms interact with their current environment, we can learn more about um, the, the life history of the organism we can learn more about the dynamics of populations, and we can also understand the evolution of body form and function. Um, larval biology has uh, grown to include um, examinations or studies that include genetics, that include eco ecological interactions, that examine the sizes and distribution of populations, and also um, the evolution of, of the organisms as a whole. Um, so they're very important stages to understand uh, if you really want to understand the, the sort of the breadth of how an organism functions. Within many different taxa, the larval stages have been given their own unique identifying names. So for example, in the top right of this slide, we see the echinoderms depicted, and the first one there is a sea urchin, Echinoidea, and that is the adult, and to the right is the, the larval stage. It is a pluteus larva for the sea urchin. If you step, uh, step down one organism, we have a sea star, asteroidea, that's the adult. And note that you know in some cases, sea stars will develop through three different larval stages. Not, not for every sea star, but for some. Uh, some may only have one, some may have two, some may have three different types. Uh, but each of those different types ha has, has been given its own name. So we have a Deplurula larva, a Bipinaria larva, and a Brachiolaria larva. If we look over to the left of the slide, maybe about halfway down, you see the term Annelida, and there is a worm that's depicted underneath it. The worm has a very unique larval form. It is called a trochophore, and you see that right to the right of the annelid Polychaeta. And some, in some cases, the trochophore larva will develop into a, a subsequent larval stage called a nectochaeta. So appreciate here the, the diversity of larval forms and note that within given taxa, there are characteristic larval forms or types that, that develop or are, are found in those particular organisms, okay? What then is larval ecology? We know now what a larva is. What is larval ecology? Well, it is the scientific study of factors that determine the distribution and abundance of larvae. It's also the study of processes or of the processes that occur during the larval stage that influence the distribution and abundance of the adults. So if you're really interested in the understanding how the organism, in this case, the larva, functions within its environment, then you are studying larval ecology. That used to be a very kind of all-encompassing term though, and now the field has broadened to include not only ecology or environmental interactions, but also physiology, uh, examinations of gene expression, uh, ecotoxicological types of studies where an organism is exposed to either toxicants or uh, you know, physical pollutants like plastic pollution microplastics, and then also studies about the evolution of organisms. And if you 
uh, include all of those different approaches, then really the field has is better defined by calling it larval biology. And that's the way that we think of it nowadays. How can we classify larvae? One way we can do this is by thinking more about their sources of nutrition. Or what do they feed on? Where do they get their energy? And we have some specialized terms that refer to where their nutrition comes from. The first term here is planktotrophic. And if we break that term down, the first part is plankto, which refers to plankton. And the second part is trophic, which is a term that refers to food or feeding. And so a, a larva that is planktotrophic is one that must feed in the plankton. The next term, lecithotrophic, the first part is lecitho, which refers to lecithin or yolk, and then again trophic, food or feeding. So a lecithotrophic larva is one that feeds on yolk. And what we mean by this is that this is an organism that gets all of its energetic requirements by feeding on the yolk that was provided to it by its mom in the egg from which the little larva is developing. So it is a yolk feeding larva. The third term here is non-planktotrophic or brooding. And what we're referring to here are those types of larvae that do not have to feed or at least not swim around uh, pretending to feed in the plankton like planktotrophic and lecithotrophic larvae do. But these are larvae that are brooded either on or within the, the body of the mother or that may be uh, retained within egg cases or a egg masses on the benthos. And so they're, again, they're going to be getting their energetic needs from their mother and they're not gonna have to feed in the plankton. We can also classify larvae by their habitat and we have a series of terms here. So planktonic, meaning up in the water column, uh, benthic, meaning on the bottom, on the benthos. Uh, demersal is a term that is used chiefly of fish and it uh, refers to a fish that lives close to the floor of the sea or, an, or the ocean or a lake. Okay, we don't really use that term with marine invertebrates, but it is a term that is used for fish and fish larvae. Uh, and then we have two other terms here, mixed and pelagic. Pelagic refers to the open water and mixed refers to an organism that spends maybe part of its life cycle up in the water column and another part of its life cycle down on the benthos. I'll talk more about habitat use and how uh, we can use those to think about larvae uh, on the next slide. But I do want to present just a few more terms, and that is that there we can also classify larvae based on their parental protection. Now these terms, oviparous, ovoviviparous, and viviparous are terms that you may have seen before if you've ever read anything about reptiles. Um, oviparous is a situation in which an organism lays an egg and then the offspring hatch from that egg that is outside of the parent's body. Ovoviviparous is a situation in which the offspring hatches from an egg that is retained within the body of the parent. And then viviparous refers to a situation in which an organism, a parent, uh, births live organisms. And so there are no eggs involved in this situation. And again, these are terms that you might see if you're studying uh, fish and fish larvae, um, certainly reptiles on land, uh, and those few reptiles that we find in association with the, the ocean. Uh, but they're not terms that we use commonly with marine invertebrates. Let's go back and look at those terms that I mentioned on the last slide that I would clarify a little bit better. Uh, and and the, this is a way of classifying larvae based on their habitat or their modes of habitat use. So one example here on the left uh, is depicted an organism that has a pelagic life cycle. In this case, it's uh, some type of uh, snail that 
has a larval form and in, and for both life stages both for the adult and the larva their entire existence is found in open water they never have any association with the benthos or with the bottom of the ocean on the right side of the slide we see an organism that has an entirely benthic life cycle in this case both the adult and the juveniles live their entire existence in association with the benthos and they never go up into the water column so an adult may deposit uh, a set or series of eggs or egg masses or egg capsules on the bottom of the ocean and within those uh, egg cases will develop little juveniles that ultimately will crawl away hatch out and crawl away from the egg case and then grow up into an adult form so for the in the case of the first on the left uh, this is an example of an organism that has larval development so there's an adult that uh, will produce gametes that will turn into you know will fertilize and then develop into a larval stage ultimately there will be metamorphosis and then that metamorphosis leads to a juvenile and then an adult stage so in this case we have larval development sometimes this is called indirect development because the the form of the organism changes between what the adult is and what it does its function and morphology and then what the larval form is and what it does in terms of its function and morphology on the right is an organism that has direct development the adult deposits eggs that grow directly into a juvenile that continues to grow once it leaves its egg case into the adult form the third situation as you might expect the one here in the middle is an example of an organism that has a mixed habitat use or in this case uh, an organism that spends part of its life cycle on the benthos in this case the adult and alternates that with a stage of the life cycle that lives its existence up in the water column in the pelagios and this is uh, an example this is what we would call something that has a mixed like mixed habitat use life cycle now i'd like to, to spend a few slides really kind of teasing out that situation number two from the previous slide where an organism has a mixed pelagic benthic type of habitat use life cycle what are the different developmental strategies that mothers employ as they are producing their eggs and ultimately the offspring that will develop from those eggs for many marine invertebrates that have a bottom dwelling adult like the sea urchin or a barnacle or corals or marine sponges or marine worms for many different types of marine invertebrates one developmental strategy is to produce larvae that have to feed in the plankton and again based on the nutrition these are going to be organisms that we refer to as planktotrophs. So specifically the larvae are planktotrophic larvae. That means that they have to feed in the plankton. And for these organisms, mothers will produce many small eggs and each individual egg has a very low yolk content, which means not much in the way of proteins, lipids and carbohydrates and if you convert those biochemical constituents into energy there's for an individual egg a very low energy investment on behalf of the mother so because there's not a lot of energy in the individual egg the larva that develops from that egg has to feed in the plankton and the planktonic phase then serves primarily as a means of feeding so these are the kind of classic little feeding machines that I was speaking about earlier in the beginning of this lecture. Another strategy that has evolved for organisms that have bottom dwelling adults like this nudibranch or perhaps a marine snail, uh, some corals are, are, are similar to what I'm about to describe. And that is for these organisms with bottom dwelling adults that also produce a larval stage in this case if the larvae develop from very large eggs 
that have a high yolk content, so plenty of proteins and lipids and carbohydrates, very high energy investment then on behalf of the mother in any individual eggs. That mother will therefore then only produce a few eggs. The larvae may be slower to hatch out of those eggs, but they are entirely dependent on that yolk source for nutrition. And therefore, their time spent up in the water is used solely as a means of dispersing away from where the mother is located. These are lesithotrophs, and they have evolved a lesithotrophic developmental strategy. These two developmental strategies, you can think of them as existing on two ends of a spectrum. On the one side, we have planktotrophy, so feeding in the plankton, and on the other, we have lesithotrophy, feeding off of energetic reserves in the yolk. And associated with those two developmental strategies are a suite of different um, characters that correlate with those different strategies. So in the case of a planktotrophic larva, the larva will have a very complex morphology because it has a, a series of different feeding structures that have to be extended away from the body in order to capture phytoplankton. Whereas in the case of the lesithotrophs, those larvae will have a very simplified type of larval morphology. And they will have lost, evolutionarily speaking, any feeding mechanisms that they might have had uh, in previous times. The mothers of the planktotrophs will produce many small eggs, whereas the larvae of the lesithotrophs will produce only a few large eggs. And thus, in terms of fecundity, which refers to how many offspring an organism produces, the planktotroph has very high fecundity, whereas the lesithotroph has very low fecundity. Because a planktotrophic larva has to feed in the plankton, it may have a very long developmental period, whereas the lesithotroph, because it already has all of the energy that it needs to develop to metamorphosis in the egg that it's developing from, then it may have a very short development. The planktotroph may experience high mortality because it is spending a longer time swimming around in the plankton trying to collect food. So there's more time available for predators to find it and to eat it. Whereas for the less of the troph, it may have much lower mortality. And in, again, in the case of mortality, we're, we're referring to death. And then the last character here is that for the planktotroph, these organisms may have very high dispersal due to the fact that they're spending a very long period of time in the plankton, and thus they can be uh, taken far away from where the, the mother originally spawned them into the water. Whereas for the less of the troph, they may have very low dispersal um, in comparison to, to what the planktotrophic larva has. So again, this is a, these two developmental strategies exist along a spectrum of different types of developmental strategies, and intermediate strategies actually exist. So there's something called facultative planktotrophy, and these are organisms that have all of the feeding structures that are necessary for collecting food from the plankton, and yet they develop from eggs that are large enough that they do not have to feed. So that's a type of intermediate strategy that falls within the spectrum of planktotrophy to lesithotrophy. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages to these two different strategies? Planktotrophs, uh, you know, an individual mother will produce a large number of offspring for a given amount of energy. So let's say that if she's going to put 100 units of energy into development, and any individual egg is going to only have one unit of energy, then she can make 100 offspring. Um, wide dispersal is probably guaranteed for these organisms because they're going to have a very long residence time in the water column. 
meaning the longer that the larva is out there, the more likely it is going to be dispersed far and wide from where the adults are located. Some of the disadvantages of planktotrophy is that these organisms are obligate planktotroph, meaning they have to feed in the plankton in order to develop. That's very different from the facultative planktotroph that I mentioned on the previous slide. An obligate planktotroph has a very unpredictable diet. It could be that you as the individual larva hatch out and there's phytoplankton everywhere where you happen to, to hatch out. And so you're in this food buffet and you're living the lush life. That's great for you, but it could also be a situation where you hatch out and you find yourself in an area where there's very, very low levels of phytoplankton food. And that is not a good thing for you at all uh, as an obligate planktotroph. Another disadvantage is that the longer time that you spend swimming around in the water column, the more likely it is that you're going to be consumed yourself, meaning more likely that you're going to be eaten by something else. For the less ethotroph, uh, these organisms, one of the advantages is that they spend less time in the water column, and therefore your odds of being eaten by something else are much lower. Another advantage is that you're not dependent on the uncertainty of any available diet because you have all of the energy that you need within the egg that you're developing from. A disadvantage, though, is that because a mother is putting more energy into an individual egg, then that means she's able to only produce fewer offspring. So if we, again, if we go back to this idea of let's assume a mother has 100 units of energy that she can put into in, into her development and she puts 10 units into an individual egg, then she's only able to make 10 offspring, whereas the planktotroph was able to make 100 offspring. <clears throat> Another disadvantage for the less ethotrophs is that because they spend less time in the water column, they will not disperse as far as a planktotrophic larva will. And another disadvantage is that a larger egg is easier for predators to detect visually. It's this whole old idea of a larger egg here is kind of a larger target for a predator to, to, to see and to find. The third type of developmental strategy that was identified by Vance is a situation in which you have a bottom-dwelling invertebrate, perhaps something like this blue-ringed octopus or many other cephalopods, uh, octopus primarily, um, also marine snails, some marine snails. But it's a situation in which you have a bottom-dwelling invertebrate that deposits eggs within an egg capsule that is attached to the bentho benthos and within that egg capsule, a larval stage, if there is one, develops, or the organism may de develop directly into a juvenile stage. Eventually, the juvenile is what hatches out of the egg capsule and then crawls away or swims away as an adult. And this is a situation in which you have non-pelagic or direct development. And it's kind of like less of the trophy taken to the extreme. So Mothers will produce only a few eggs. Each individual egg has a very large amount of yolk. The larvae or the juveniles undergo long development. They might pass through a larval stage, but that larval stage stays retained within the egg in the egg capsule. And then ultimately there is a hatching as a juvenile. And again, there's no free swimming larval stage for these organisms. An advantage of this type of development is that it reduces planktonic mortality to, to nothing, to zero, because there is never a situation in which the organism is up in the plankton. Um, a disadvantage, though, is that any individual mother only produces a few eggs because each egg has such high energetic investment. And another disadvantage is that the dispersal is effectively zero. So because of the juvenile hatches out right from where the mother attached the egg capsule to the benthos, then the, there is no dispersal at all during the, the larval or the developmental period. 
what can we say about the prevalence of certain larval types or specific developmental strategies and particular geographical regions? Or in other words, what's best for what geography? The short answer is that there's really not a clear-cut answer, but there are some broad patterns. The first is that in polar waters, non-pelagic development is more common. This has to do with the fact that there's really only a narrow window of time during the summer when there is significant phytoplankton food availability for developing larvae in the water column. Um, that narrow window of time coincides with when there is significant light due to the increase in solar light radiation as the, the region progresses from spring into summer and when warming waters uh, fuel the formation of a phytoplankton bloom. So if you're an adult and you are trying to time your reproduction with the availability of food for your larvae, it may be a better strategy to have evolved a non-pelagic form of development. In temperate and tropical waters where the predictability of phytoplankton food for your larvae is, is higher, even in the tropics where the amount, the overall amount of phytoplankton food is really low, at least it's still predictable, you're more likely to find planktotrophic development. You may also find that planktotrophic development is favored in those areas where there are few predators, where maybe it's imperative for there to be uh, dispersal, and also in those areas where uh, it's possible to have long developmental times. In the situation of lecithotrophic development, lecithotrophic development will be found in areas where compared to non-pelagic development, dispersal is important. And also when you're comparing lecithotrophic development to planktotrophic development, lecithotrophic development will be favored in those areas where planktonic mortality is high. And so it would be more important for larvae to get out of the water column and metamorphose into the juvenile stage more quickly. Several hypotheses exist as to why organisms may have a particular type of larval development. There's been some fascinating research done over many decades in terms of uh, these types of questions. And I encourage you to at least start with some of the references that I've listed here but note that many exceptions occur. So while the short answer was that there was not a clear cut answer in terms of what's best for what geography, the longer answer is really that there are many factors involved in selecting for a given larval type. And these factors will vary between organisms and habitats, both in space and in time. Ultimately, larvae will reach a point in which they will undergo metamorphosis and ultimately settle into the, the benthos, into either the juvenile or the adult habitat. And settlement is dependent on a number of different physical cues. Those cues can include abiotic factors, such as the amount of light or the temperature uh, it could be gravity or the movement of fluid, water um, flowing over a particular substrate. The settlement may also be dependent upon biotic factors as cues, such as just developmental timing or chemical cues from conspecifics, and that means other organisms that are of the same species. And in particular, it, it may include pheromones that are being released from adults that tell larvae that this is a good place to settle. I should emphasize that larvae do not just quote unquote settle out. There are specific preferences exhibited by an individual larva for a particular area of settlement. And a larva or larvae plural can test the substrate. So they may chemically taste it uh, they may assess whether or not the water flow is, is appropriate, 
or whether or not it has the right light availability or the right temperature, et cetera, any of those cues that I just mentioned. And if an area is unsu unsuitable, then a larva can move on to another area and test that area. I should also mention that larvae can delay metamorphosis if they cannot encounter a suitable substrate. And some larvae have the capability of, of shutting down their metabolic processes to uh, an exceedingly low level until such time that, that they do encounter an area that is appropriate for settlement. If you're interested in understanding more about settlement and larvae, then I encourage you to visit the website of Jesus Pineda at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which is where I um, sourced this particular image that highlights the different biotic and abiotic factors that affect settlement in many marine organisms. Settlement and metamorphosis are often coincident, meaning they happen at this around the same time. And metamorphosis can involve a very rapid and radical reorganization of the animal body plan, similar to what we see with many of these different echinoderms that I've depicted for you here. In the case of the sea urchin, the pluteus larval form will metamorphose into the juvenile by resorbing the larval arms that stick out away from the body and shunting the energy that comes from the breakdown of those larval structures into the formation of juvenile structures. Uh, the brittle star also has a pluteus larval form that undergoes this very radical reorganization into uh, the juvenile that is star-shaped. And a sea star will turn a bipinaria or brachiolaria larva into a juvenile sea star, star also with a very uh, rapid and radical reorganization. Um, or it could be that metamorphosis is not very rapid or radical. And we see something like that here with the, the nudibranch, this mollusk, uh, as it tests a substrate for settlement and then slowly kind of crawls away from the larval shell and, and becomes a, a juvenile. The, the metamorphosis, metamorphic process is not very uh, radical um, it's not this exceedingly large transformation from something that's very different to something in the larval form to something that's very kind of different in the, in the adult form or the juvenile form. Before we finish up, I want to put larvae and the life cycles of marine invertebrates in the context of modern biology. Many biologists and students of biology understand that model organisms, so organisms such as sea elegans or drosophila or zebrafish, the laboratory mouse or arabidopsis, these organisms are exceedingly important if what your goal is to do is to experimentally investigate biological processes to great depth. These types of organisms facilitate the precise dissection of causal relationships in biology. If you're more interested in evolutionary questions, then those types of biologists will employ what are known as model clades, or groups of organisms that are closely related to one another in which there are characteristics that differ between representative members and allow for evolutionary questions about the origin of traits. One of the classic model clades are the finches of the Galapagos, or Darwin's finches, and these are a group of species that are closely related and yet have evolved um, significant differences in the function and morphology of their beaks. And other examples of model clades include the Enolis lizards that have been studied by Jonathan Losos and his colleagues and students, and also uh, a group of flowers that are known as Mimulus, that's the genus, or they're commonly called monkey flower. Model clades, in model clades, the phylogenetic relationships are very well established, and studying model clades allows for detailed morphological and behavioral knowledge uh, about different species.
So they also have a very important place in modern biology. Where do larvae and life cycles of marine invertebrates fit in in modern biology? Well, they actually fit in to a third category that we can call model life histories. <clears throat> and the life history, is, I know that I've used that term earlier, but what it is, is it's more than just the life cycle. Many of you probably learned the life cycle of a butterfly when you were in elementary school. And these organisms, as you may remember, have an egg that's deposited by the butterfly on a leaf, uh, turns into a caterpillar that gathers a lot of food before uh, turning into a chrysalis or a pupa. And then within that chrysalis, there is metamorphosis to the adult butterfly. In marine invertebrates, there are a few organisms, such as the purple sea urchin, that are used as model organisms for early development, but the full scope of the organism's life is not considered by those researchers. Most model organisms are direct developers without a larval form. Marine invertebrates are not monophyletic. Most of these organisms develop indirectly. They pass through one or more distinctive larval phases. And the name life history then suggests that comparisons at this level are made across the temporal sequence of the organism, in addition to those that are made within or across clades. So in the case of the sea urchin, there is an egg, there are a series of subsequent larval stages, there's metamorphosis to a juvenile, and then ultimately to an adult. This category of a model life history provides for the recognition of very novel kinds of representation, such as marine invertebrate larvae acting as surrogate models of ocean environments under changing climatic conditions. So we can use these model life histories to tease apart the way that organisms um, uh, interact with their environments and also how those different or changing environments ultimately lead to differences in the development of organisms. If you're really interested in these topics, you're uh, certainly welcome to, to uh, contact me. You can also ask questions to our Facebook group, which is Marine Biology at Home. And I encourage you to, to be in touch. Some of the different people working on the lecture series have been introduced in previous lectures. And I'll just uh, show their pictures again here and you can uh, contact Seabird McKeon if you have questions specifically about the, the lecture series. And if you want to help, feel free to get in touch if you'd like to donate a lecture or if you'd like to assist with online learning. We hope to hear from you. Thanks a lot.